Welcome to our special video to explain the relationship between the high leverage practices for special education and evidence-based practices. There are a range of sources for content in this video, including the IRIS Center, the What Works Clearinghouse, the Council for Exceptional Children, and peer-reviewed journal articles included in the reference list. This video is split into two parts. In part one, we discuss how high leverage practices which we refer to as HLPs, and evidence-based practices, or EBPs, can be used in a complementary way to improve special and general education teachers' instruction for students with disabilities. In part two, we show video clips of real teachers in schools using HLPs and EBPs in a complementary manner. Part one, what are EBPs and HLPs, and how do they work together? Effective instruction involves educators using the best available research. In combination with other considerations, such as students' individual needs and goals, the particular instructional context, and teachers' wisdom of practice to guide decisions about what and how to teach. An important component of evidence-based education is instructional practices are shown to improve outcomes for specific populations of learners by multiple high-quality experimental studies. We often refer to these as evidence-based practices or EBPs. Various educational organizations, such as the What Works Clearinghouse and the Council for Exceptional Children, have developed standards for identifying the amount of evidence from rigorous and methodologically sound studies needed for an educational practice to be labeled as an EBP. Despite some differences in their standards, these organizations seek to identify practices shown by a body of sound research to result in improved academic or behavioral outcomes. In sum, when evidence-based practices are established, available, and are a good fit for the student and instructional context, they should be prioritized. HLPs are instructional and professional practices special and general educators may employ alone or in collaboration to implement EBPs to make needed adjustments to instruction, as well as when a specific EBP isn't available for a particular situation. They may also help ensure students with disabilities are supported according to the tenets of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Most of the HLPs are broader than specific EBPs but are still critical touchstones of practice for designing and delivering an evidence-based education. It is important to note that some HLPs have more evidence than others. The HLPs were written by a multidisciplinary team of experts to be applicable across all students and all grade levels. In addition, the HLPs complement EBPs by offering skills and actions necessary for the successful implementation of specific practices and programs, as well as to make appropriate adjustments in EBPs to improve their effectiveness with individual students. Simply put, using HLPs in combination with EBPs may contribute to a more effective and individualized education for all students with disabilities. For example, HLPs like explicit instruction, providing high quality feedback, and using flexible student groupings are necessary to the successful implementation of many EBPs. For example, each would be used to implement the evidence-based practice of schema instruction to help solve word problems in mathematics. Other HLPs are critical for designing and delivering effective instruction for students with disabilities. To illustrate, HLPs 1 through 6 are about collaboration, assessment, and database decision-making. 
These HLPs are necessary for developing student goals for instruction, planning instruction, and evaluating effectiveness. In sum, EBPs and HLPs do not exist in a vacuum. They are both necessary to ensure that general and special education teachers can design and deliver an effective education for each student. Research exists to support some HLPs, but others are too broad to lend themselves to being studied within controlled environments. This should not suggest some HLPs are more important than others. Rather, each teacher should carefully select appropriate practices based on students' unique needs. In many instances, this will mean prioritizing specific evidence-based practices complemented by select HLPs. Part 2. Examples of EBPs and HLPs being used within lessons. Now that we've described the importance of HLPs and EBPs and how they might be used together, let's take a look at some examples of teachers using them together to provide effective instruction. In this first clip, Ms. Bree Barnes is reviewing class procedures for lining up at the door. The explicit review and reteaching of class procedures is an evidence-based practice in the domain of classroom management. The procedures are predictable and promote the smooth operation of the classroom given the clear steps. This procedure has been explicitly taught. Ms. Barnes is taking time here to review and rehearse the procedure, and this is a routine for a problematic area in the classroom. She also provides students with multiple opportunities to respond and has students model examples and non-examples of the expected behavior with corresponding discussion and confirmation of learning. For more information about EBPs for classroom management, please visit www.pbis.org. So we're going to go over just a few of our classroom expectations this morning so that you can remember them and end your time as a fourth grader really well. One thing I want to practice because we've been kind of being really noisy when we've been lining up is lining up at the door. Who can tell us what that sounds like? When we line up at the door, Corinne, what does that sound like? Level zero. Level zero. And what does that mean if you're at a level zero, Corinne? Quiet. Quiet. I shouldn't hear you. I shouldn't hear your feet. I shouldn't hear your voice. Let's talk about what that looks like. When we're lining up at the door, Josh, what should I see? You should see us not talking and not jumbling up and pushing each other. So our hands are to ourselves. What else should I see, D'Angelo? Standing quiet. Standing quietly. And I'm just going to put standing because sometimes we like to get over there and we like to sit on the table or lean against Moses' desk over there or get up against the mailbox, but we're just standing in our spot. All right, I need some volunteers who are going to show us the correct way to line up at the door. So when I tell you to line up, I'm gonna have Carter, Naomi, Corinne, Heritage, and Sayera. You five are going to line up at the door the right way. So show us what it should look like. Line up at the door. to show us how not to line up because some of us are in this bad habit of lining up totally totally crazily and we got to see what not to do who can tell us what they're doing wrong because it doesn't sound like or look like what we just said we should be doing Kalia what are they doing wrong now let's consider this same clip through the lens of the HLPs. HLP 7 is all about creating a positive, organized, and respectful learning environment. Explicitly teaching and reteaching classroom expectations, routines, and procedures are included within this broad HLP. In addition, Ms. Barnes utilizes HLP 16, using explicit instruction to review and reteach class procedures by including examples and non-examples. She uses HLP 18, Engaging Students, by providing numerous OTRs and involving students in the modeling of examples and non-examples. Additionally, 
Ms. Barnes used data during her lesson planning to arrive at the decision that she needed to reteach the procedures. In this second example, Ms. Aisha Samuels is leading a small group mathematics lesson online due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The evidence-based practice she is using is the use of manipulatives to help students practice solving story problems with counting skills in a real-world context. This lesson has been adapted from the Intensive Intervention series on www.intensiveintervention.org. So now that we got that squared away, I'm going to show you guys a neat little trick about counting on. So my favorite thing to eat right now is these little candies, and they're different colors, and they're fruity, and they have a little S on the front. Do you guys know what candy that might be? Skittles. Skittles! Skittles. So my first example is going to be about Skittles, okay? And I want you guys to watch me first, and then we're going to do a couple of problems together, and then you're going to have your own chance. You ready? Thumbs up if you're ready. Thumbs sideways if you're not sure, and down if you're not. All right, you guys are ready. All right, good. Let's get going. So I'm going to start off with this first. Miss Samuels had five Skittles. So I'm going to grab my pretend Skittles, and I'm going to put five on my foot. One. Two, three, four, five. I have five Skittles on my plate. Give me a windshield check if you can see that there's five. Windshield check. You see that there's five? Awesome. Thank you guys for letting me know. Great. And I know you guys can see it. So I have five Skittles on my plate. Then my mom gave me seven more. So now I'm going to grab my new colored Skittles. These are these little blue ones. I'm going to put seven more, but I'm going to put them beside my one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Can you guys see that? Windshield check. Yeah? You did awesome. So now I'm going to count on to see how many I have all together or in total. So I have one, two, three, four, five here, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 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 So now I have twelve all together. So I started off with how many? Can you show me on your hands? Do you remember? Good job. I started off with five and then I added seven more. So I counted more. I started off from five and I counted five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So now I have twelve. Do you guys want to do one with me? All right, I'm gonna let Will pick first. Will, what is your favorite thing to eat right now? Um, muffins. <laughs> muffins. <laughs> what flavor muffins? Chocolate chip. Chocolate chip? Chocolate chip or just chocolate muffins? Chocolate chip muffins. Chocolate chip muffins. All right, let's do it, bud. So we're gonna start with Will. Will had Seven chocolate chip muffins <laughs> <laughs> for breakfast this morning. So how many do you think we should start off with on our plate? Seven. Seven. So I want you guys to grab seven of your chocolate chip muffins, and I want you to put those on your plate. Ready? One, two, three, four, All right, I see Will is putting his seven on his plate. You can go ahead too, Greg, and put your seven chocolate chip muffins on your plate. Okay. And I see Will is going back to count them too to make sure he has seven. Good job. All right, Greg, you want to go back and double check and make sure you got seven? How can you do that? Good. I like how you're touching those. Make sure you got them. So we have seven chocolate chips. So Will has seven chocolate chip cup cupcakes. Muffins for breakfast. Then his dad gave him three more. So I want you guys to get three more chocolate chip cupcakes. But guess what? Wait a minute. You're going to put them to the side so that you can remember that you're adding how many? Show me your fingers. How many? How many? Show me your fingers. How many more? Three more. So go ahead and add three more to the side. One, two. 
Yeah, Steve has his three. Awesome. And then you have your three, two, Greg. So we're going to use the counting on strategy to figure out how many chocolate chip muffins, if I can remember this, how many chocolate chip muffins we'll have all together. So we're going to start with the seven and we're going to count on. So seven, will you want to count for me? Seven. Eight, nine, ten. Awesome. Seven, eight, nine, ten. I love how you counted out loud and you also said the number as you touched them. Greg, you want to try it too, bud? He started off with how many on his plate? Seven. Seven. And then can you show me how you would count? Eight, nine. One. Eight, nine. And what else? Ten. Good job. There you go. Awesome. Kiss your brains. You're like, I gotta do that. <laughs> Now consider the same clip through the lens of the HLPs. First, she uses HLP 16, Use Explicit Instruction. Ms. Samuels used several components of this practice, including clear language, modeling, guided practice, and lots of OTRs. She provides the students with specific and positive feedback on their effort and performance. Ms. Samuels provides this instruction to a small group and provides them with scaffolded supports through the use of counting blocks through all phases of the lesson. Although not shown, it's clear Ms. Samuels worked with colleagues and the families, informed by data, to identify the most effective instruction for the target students. Various formal and informal data were gathered to inform decision-making before, during, and after individual lessons. Finally, Ms. Samuels is working towards addressing specific learning goals for her students by providing needed adaptations and systematically designed lessons towards those goals. In conclusion for the special video, HLPs and EBPs are both necessary to provide students with an evidence-based education. EBPs are specific strategies teachers can use for specific content and learners' needs. They should be prioritized whenever possible so students receive specially designed instruction to address their individual goals. Whereas HLPs are the strategies teachers can use to support effective implementation, adapt instruction for individual students, and design and implement instruction when EBPs are not available. Teachers can implement HLPs to make appropriate adjustments to their instruction, thereby enhancing students' learning and behavior as intended. Thanks for watching, and please continue using resources from www.highleveragepractices.org and other high quality resources sponsored by OSEP and CEC.